Let the Bible Speak with your speaker, Brett Hickey. We strive on Let the Bible Speak to do just that. Let the Bible Speak. We seek to uphold the same commitment to Scripture as a whole that the Apostle Paul had when he told the Ephesian elders at Miletus in Acts 20, 27, For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Philip Yancey, in his book, Why Pray, mentions a peculiar omission in a 700-page book titled On Being a Christian by Swiss Roman Catholic theologian Hans Kuhn. Yancey explains that he did not include a chapter or even an entry on prayer. When asked later, Kung said that he regretted the oversight. He was feeling so harassed by Vatican censors and by his publisher's deadlines that he simply forgot about prayer. We have addressed the topic of prayer in the past, but not per much, perhaps as much as we should have in recent weeks and months. We'll begin to correct that unintentional oversight this morning. How do you feel about praying? Are you satisfied with your prayer life? We want to go to heaven, but how frequently do we pray? Aren't children of God transported, spiritually speaking, from earth to heaven when we pray? Of course, in one sense, God is always in our midst. David writes in Psalm 139, beginning with verse 7, Where can I go from your spirit, or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you were there. If I make my bed in hell or Sheol, behold, you were there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall guide me. Again, in Hebrews 13, 5, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Scripture certainly suggests that there is a special closeness to God, however, found in prayer. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And the more thoroughly we understand what is happening in prayer, the more we will long to spend time with the Father. We certainly begin to get some idea of the importance of prayer when we read how the apostles handled the crisis. We read in Acts chapter 6, verse 1 and 7. Notice verse 1. Now, in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. This problem was so huge that the apostles had to call a halt to their urgent work to seek resolution to the issue. It's obvious from reading the conclusion of the paragraph in verse 7 that whatever action was taken was very effective. Verse 7 reads, Then the word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Let's notice now what action was taken. Acts 6, beginning with verse 2. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business." but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. The apostles were deeply concerned about the widows being neglected, but they were unable to devote themselves to the widow's care and also to do the soul-saving work assigned to them. Someone else had to be assigned to meeting the widow's needs. Of all the activities that they could have singled out that was part of their mission, 
the apostles mention only two. While they, of course, were committed to the ministry of the Word, they first insist, we will give ourselves continually in prayer. Doubtless, we bolster every activity for the Lord when we, too, give ourselves continually in prayer. More on prayer, but first, enjoy our song. So Philip Yancey writes again, when a doctoral student at Princeton asked, what is there left in the world for original dissertation research? Albert Einstein replied, find out about prayer. Somebody must find out about prayer. Well, really all we need to know about prayer is right here in the Word of God. The Bible has so much to say about prayer and I have so much to learn. What does the New Testament say about praying? There's a series of scriptures I want to share with you that really uh, address the importance of prayer. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 17 and 18, Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Luke 18, 1, Then Jesus spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray, and not lose heart. Incidentally, we see here that frequent prayer is more than a privilege. It is a duty. Men always ought to pray, Jesus says. Luke 21, 36, watch therefore and pray always. Romans 12, 12, continuing steadfastly in prayer. Ephesians 5, 20, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians 6, 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Colossians 4, 2, continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Philippians 4, 6, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Colossians 3, 17, and whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God the Father through Him. What other religious activity do we find this much scriptural emphasis on something that is to be done without ceasing, always, etc.? When I see what the Scripture teaches on prayer, it is obvious that I have a lot of growing up to do spiritually. No one in the world cares more about me than God does. He loves me more than my wife, more than my children, more than my own mother. Yet how eager am I, outside of crises, to spend time with God in prayer? Bishop Lancelot Andrews, hundreds of years ago, was said to pray five hours a day. Charles Simeon, four hours a day. And Martin Luther started his day with three hours of prayer. 
we may never spend so many continuous hours in prayer. But I do know this, if I prayed more, I would live better. I know that if I prayed better, I would do more. If I prayed more, I would be a better teacher, a better Christian, a better spouse, a better father, and a better son. Ponder this with me. What do the deficiencies in my prayer life indicate? They may indicate that I've been going through times of ingratitude, inadequate faith, or maybe I have an independent spirit. Perhaps I credit myself for the strength of my marriage, the faithfulness of my spouse, the good behavior of my children, the ability to live in a modest home, the ability to enjoy good health. Do I take credit for having a job to support my family? If so, maybe that's why I don't pray more. Do I claim personal responsibility for receiving a good education? My prayer life may suffer if I've had a relatively easy life. Or it may suffer because I would prefer to worry than pray when I'm troubled. Maybe my prayer life is inadequate because I prefer to bellyache and complain over taking my troubles to God in prayer. What a friend we have in Jesus. Question, if we view prayer as a chore, do we really think we would enjoy heaven? I mean, after all, the biggest part of being in heaven is simply being with God, isn't it? The bottom line in our prayer deficiencies is that prayer is wholly spiritual, and we tend to be carnal. The Holy Spirit explains in Romans 8, 5 through 8, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit the things of the Spirit. You see what I mean? For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. That's our battle. As we overcome the flesh and become more spiritual, our prayer life will grow. Imagine not being able to pray in a crisis, in a great trial, in times of loneliness or confusion. The ability to talk to God in prayer is one of the faithful Christians' most profound blessings. On the other hand, the inability to pray is one of the heaviest burdens atheists and agnostics force upon themselves. No doubt that's why we say there are no atheists in foxholes. No one wants to be in such a vulnerable position without anyone more powerful to go to for help. Even when they are not in foxholes, Many atheists and agnostics feel compelled to pray. Imagine that. Christine Wicker writes in a September 25, 2013, Psychology Today article titled, Do Atheists Pray? Do atheists and agnostics pray? Yes, quite a bit, it turns out. According to the Pew Research Center, 6% of atheists and agnostics pray every day. And 11% of atheists and agnostics pray weekly or monthly. If you're thinking 11% is not a significant amount, remember, we're talking about atheists. There is a mystery, though, in the article, and that is to whom exactly are these unbelievers directing their prayers? They don't believe in God. Yancey again reports, During the heady days of communism in Russia, true believers kept a red corner, placing a portrait of Lenin where Christians used to keep their icons. Pravda, the political newspaper, encouraged its readers in 1950 communist Russia, if you meet with difficulties in your work or suddenly doubt your abilities, think of him, of Stalin, and you will find all the confidence you need. If you feel tired in an hour when you should not, think of him, of Stalin, and your work will go well. If you are seeking a correct decision, think of him, Stalin and you will find that decision. They were encouraging unbelieving citizens to pray to Stalin. What a pitiful substitute to praying to an omniscient, omnipotent God. Prayed to a dead man? 
Although only 25 to 40 percent of Americans attend church services weekly, the 2010 General Social Survey reported that three of five Americans pray daily, one of five pray weekly, and only 13 percent say they never pray. Even that number, 13 percent, is a recent phenomenon. In the 80s, only one percent of Americans reported never praying. Only 2% said they never prayed in the 90s. That number increased to 10% in 2004 and has been creeping upward ever since. This information, though, supports the idea that we were created with a natural yearning to pray. We were made with a desire to look to someone greater to whom we can look for forgiveness, to whom we may express gratitude, and to whom we can go for help in time of need. We know little of Jesus' Bible study habits. We know on the one hand that Jesus is the Son of God and the Word throughout eternity, John 1 and 1. But yet Jesus was also a man with limitations imposed on any life in the flesh. So how much knowledge did Jesus have by virtue of who he was and how much, if anything, did he have to learn? Surely Joseph and Mary taught him diligently as Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 7 commanded, at age 12, Jesus was in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. While we do not know how much, or we do not know much about Jesus' Bible study habits, we do know about Jesus' prayer habits. We know he prayed all the time. Luke 5, verse 16, So Jesus often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. Jesus God's Son never sinned and had already known the Father intimately throughout eternity. So if Jesus needed to pray, how much more do we need to pray? Since Jesus was God's Son, why did He need to pray at all? Jesus loved the Father so much that He cherished those quiet moments in the Father's presence. You see, the fact that Jesus spent eternity with the Father as the Word, John 1 and 1, was all the more reason why Jesus was so anxious to talk with the Father in prayer. Again, while Jesus was still God, John 20, 28, He was now in a body of flesh and blood with all its weaknesses and frailties. Hebrews 2, verse 14 and 17. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood... Jesus himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. Therefore, in all things, Jesus had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Hebrews 4.15, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. Or in other words, we have a high priest who can sympathize with our weaknesses, who was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Jesus as a man knew weariness, loneliness, hunger, pain, sorrow, abuse. He craved closeness to the Father, and he met this need in prayer. When did you meet God today? Did you wake up praying? Start everything you do with prayer. Did Jesus do anything without praying to the Father? Prayer was the main thing in Jesus' life. Jesus built his ministry much differently than many do today in religion. Jesus did not build his ministry on politics, not on popularity, not on worldly, raucous entertainment, but simply on prayer. We need to understand that just because we pray does not mean God will hear or answer our prayer. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. David tells us in Psalm 66, 18, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. We have to listen to God in His Word if we want Him to listen to us. 
some protests against this truth. In fact, a viewer responding to our message on the sinner's prayer some time back insisted that the sinner's prayer for salvation was taught in Luke 18, verse 10 through 14. This is an important passage on the importance of the right attitude in prayer, but certainly does not teach that a prayer for salvation can save someone outside of Christ. Let's read Luke 18, beginning with verse 10. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. It's key to understand that both these men were Jews and already in a covenant relationship with God through the law of Moses, circumcision, and so on. They were not seeking for initial salvation in Christ, as many do today. In fact, this took place while Jesus was alive and before the New Testament age had ever gone into effect. Jesus went on to say in verse 14, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. We'll scroll down just a bit. So we see how important it is to have the right attitude in prayer, but prayer to God is not uh, something that is done to ob obtain salvation. It's not an appropriate time to preach. It certainly does not ingratiate us with the Father to tell Him how much superior we are to others. We are unable. We'll scroll up just a little bit. We are unable to present new information to God. Once we are truly Christians, we may pray for forgiveness under the teaching of the New Testament. We read in Acts 8, 13 of Simon the sorcerer becoming a Christian. The Bible says, Then Simon himself also believed, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip. Later in the same chapter, when he sinned by attempting to purchase the ability to convey spiritual gifts, Peter told him in Acts 8, 22, Repent therefore of this your wickedness, and pray God if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. The apostle addresses the same circumstance in 1 John 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, once we have our sins forgiven and are added to the church through baptism, we may pray for forgiveness when we repent and confess our sins. But first, we must obey the gospel. First, we must find ourselves in a covenant relationship with God. First, we must be translated from the kingdom of this world to the kingdom of God's dear Son. If you'd like to receive a free copy, a free DVD of this sermon or CD, Stay with us, and we'll tell you how to do so right after our song. There's a pop of ringing on the restless waves in the light. In the light. In the light. In the light. There are souls to rescue. There are souls to save. In the light. 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 In the light.
Thank you for watching Let the Bible Speak. We pray you have heard God speak to you through His Word. We're always glad that you join us, but we want you to understand that the program is not intended to be a substitute for assembling with the saints. This is so very important for any who are trying to serve God once they become a child of God. Hebrews 10, verse 23, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. If you'd like to help in obeying, if you'd like help in obeying the Lord, we hope you'll contact us. If you'd like a copy of this sermon, prayer number 944, please write us or call us and we'll be glad to get it out to you. You may also request a free Bible study course by mail. Please visit our website, letthebiblespeak.com, and watch videos, hear podcasts, and read transcripts of the program at your convenience. On behalf of the congregations mentioned shortly, we echo the sentiment of the Apostle Paul when he wrote in Romans chapter 16, verse 16, the churches of Christ salute you. Until next week, goodbye, and God bless.